I recognize most of you. I think there are probably a couple that have been, weren't here this last uh, two weeks ago now, I guess it was. My name's Adam. Adam? Yes. What's your name? Chuck. Chuck, good to meet you, Chuck. Glad you're here. This is anybody not familiar with the book of Genesis? Not familiar? Okay, so this will be valuable for a few of you guys and some of this will be review. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be firm, firm, firmament. firmament in the midst of the water, and let it, let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, Let the water from the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called the seas. And saw, and God saw that it was good. Amen. Okay, and then pick up in verse. <laughs> uh, then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the earth that yields seed, and the fruit the tree, the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And on the third, on, and the earth brought forth grass, the earth that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be signs for let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give life to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Anybody want to pick up from there? <laughs> then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to his kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping things, and the beast of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, and cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the earth and every other living thing that moves on the earth. Amen. And 
God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird in the air, and everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and in the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host with them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It's the one that flowed around the whole of the land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It's the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush, and the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say to you not to eat any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of any of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, 
and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and, you, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So, it didn't take long in the Bible for things to go pretty far south. You have a perfect world for about uh, two and a half chapters. And then we got two problems from there. We don't know how long they were alive before he did the thing. Right. We don't know. It could have been weeks. It could, it could have been months. Of years. It could have been months. Yeah, it could have been years. We don't know. I think it was billions of years. They said it was billions of years. Because they walked with God. Who used to say they didn't walk with God? Well, we are told uh, the age of Adam and Eve when they died, and it was less than a thousand years. True, yeah. but I think time was still kept while they were still alive before the earth. Yes? Could be, could be referring to angels. It could be referring to the Trinity. There's also, I think, the most conventional answer to that is how sometimes somebody of royalty will refer to themselves as we, like the king said, let us, you know, send a chartered ship to something. It's sort of a royal way, like an authority, authoritarian, authoritative way to talk about yourself. Yeah, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, the Son did exist at this point. We're just not specifically told about how the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we're not given that much information until later on. Talks about, yeah. The Word was, yeah, in the beginning, the Word was with God and the Word was God. Right, God is uncaused, He is self-existing. Something's always been here. There's something that strikes me in our book, but where you got it. But it's all like, do animals have a choice? Like, do they obey God or not obey God? Why would you curse the snake to crawl on the belly if they don't have You know what I mean? Like, so, yeah, this is, um, I think the book of Job gives a little bit more insight to this about the fall of Satan. Because it was Satan in the serpent, and Satan right. was referred to through the Bible as the serpent. And so, yeah, it was, it is interesting, because it makes you wonder, okay, were snakes the only thing that talked? And it was, was it because Satan was in one, or did all animals talk back yeah. then? Don't, don't really know. Apparently it did, because apparently its curse was that it wouldn't have legs anymore and have to crawl around on its belly. But yeah, it is interesting that uh, the animals are not created in the image of God. Only people are. And so the reason that we're put, there's a lot of answers in here. It's like, okay, well, why do, why do people wear clothes? Why, why do we feel shame if we're naked? You better be. I used to think like I 
I can hide from God. You know what I mean? Like, I need to hide from God. And I used to think it all the time. And then, and then it wasn't until I relapsed. Whenever I was relapsed, I was doing my drug. Uh, you know, when I was putting this over, trying to overcome it, of course, I was getting worried of the person using a frame, good at police, whatever. And then when I was relapsed, all of a sudden, I wouldn't pray. I wouldn't listen to the word. And I wouldn't worship. You know what I mean? Music, nothing. And it was like I was hiding from God. Yeah, that's exactly. I mean, well, yeah, and you, you know, can't. <laughs> I, mean, I know you can't really hide from God, but I mean, that's where, you know, it comes close to me. It's like, that's how I mean, I got to you know I mean? mm -hmm. If you've ever read the book of Jonah, that's what that prophet tried to do. Yeah. God told him, go here, talk to these people. And yeah. he literally yeah. gets on a ship, tries to sail the other way. Correct me if I'm wrong, but here's what I kind of get right. Humans, it says we're made in God's image. What is God? It says in the Bible that God is love. So, He made us in our image. None of the other animals are made in the image, so they don't love each other. They don't love nothing. They feel no love. We are different because we feel love. And so, we're made in God's image because God is love. Mm -hmm. We have a sense of justice where animals don't. <laughs> some animals don't care. Some animals care, some animals don't. It depends on the animal. There are some There are some breeds of birds, they'll lay eggs and they just leave immediately after they lay them. They're gone. Does anybody notice here uh, when God confronts Adam and he says, why did you eat from this tree? What does Adam say? The woman you gave me. God, it's your fault. This isn't, this isn't my fault. That's a pretty natural response. <laughs> and then God goes to Eve and he says, Eve, what did you do? And she says, well, it's the serpent. It's this creature that you made. It came up and, and deceived me. Also, you notice, you notice um, when the serpent asks Eve, what did God say? <laughs> Eve says the right thing, but then she also adds something a little bit to it that wasn't quite right. Did anybody notice what that was? This is in chapter 3, verse 3. Um, let's see, starting in verse 2. Um, chapter 3, verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of, of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Did God say that? He didn't say to, not to touch it. She's adding things to it, which... It's fine that she had that attitude because, yeah, if you eat of it, well, you probably shouldn't touch it either. Like, why, why walk right up to the edge of a cliff and be like, whoa, whoa, I didn't fall. It's, I'm okay. It's, I can, like, lean over the edge. So that's, that's a healthy thing not to touch something that you're not supposed to eat. But then she, she says that God said that, and God didn't say. So she already immediately afterwards, didn't have exactly what God said in her mind. Also, if you'll notice, to, to those of you that know the end of how this story ends, uh, chapter 3, verse 15, he's talking to the serpent here. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between you and your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise his head, talking about Eve's offspring. Eve's offspring shall bruise the head of the serpent, and the serpent will bruise the heel of her offspring. Does anybody know what that's talking about? It's talking about Christ. Christ, Christ defeats the serpent by dying on the cross. And bruising the heel of Christ was him, him dying. So he was wounded. I've heard somebody say that the only the only imperfect thing in heaven will be the wounds of on Christ's body that are still there. Everything else will be perfect and restored. One twenty seven. So God created a man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
the first chapter is kind of a summary of the whole thing, and then it goes back and gives a little bit more detail in the following chapters. That, that is Eve there. Uh, and you notice, I don't know if it, it is in your Bible, but it's kind of offset to like a little bit of a, it's indented differently. It's kind of separated from the text around it. It basically delves into to poetry there for just a second and then continues on. Well, Eve had that same problem, so I'm not sure why Eve wouldn't be the first, because she she rebelled for, she rebelled under Adam as well. They talked about Lilith later on. Lilith, yeah. I I actually don't know about that. So do you believe that Lilith was first? I don't know, because Eve is talking about Eve is called the mother of all the living. Well, was Eve the mother of Lilith? Well, that would make her not the the mother of all the living. I mean, Eve, Eve's name, literally, that's what it means. Well, in uh, Genesis, if, if we go down a couple more chapters, Genesis 5-4, it says, Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters besides Cain and Abel. This was before God gave the laws about incest. So it was Adam and Eve, and then their children, they married each other and kept having. And it wasn't for a long time before God said, it was like two, two cousins removed that you're not allowed to marry. What's that? Something like that. I forget the exact. <laughs> okay, so I thought that would be uh, an interesting thing for some discussion there. That's a good. It's it's good to start at the beginning sometimes. Very beginning, that's what they did. Oh, you mean you mean even now? Like everybody's distantly related. Yeah. I mean, somewhere along the line, this man's my brother. Mm-hmm. I mean, for real. Yeah. If you go back up far enough, both of you. Yeah. Eventually, you get back. You get back to Noah. You get back to eight people at the, at the flood, and then before that, obviously, you go all the way back, and it goes to Adam and Eve. <laughs> yes. now, I, I literally sleep with my sister right now. Right? Yeah, so I go home to my, my home, you know, and I you know, let my sister down and then I sleep. We have a kid. So this is reversing time. And I'm not even as a joke. I'm literally being serious. Is this just like start reversing time? Um, so let's see. I think it's in Leviticus that talks about the penalties for incest. I'm being serious. Yeah, you start to compound uh, genetic defects. Yeah, I believe that's the reason that God gave it. Uh, if you'll turn to Deuteronomy 27, verse 22. So here... Yeah, it's uh, in Deuteronomy 27, verse 22, it says, Cursed be anyone who lies with his sister. Whether the... Quiet, quiet for a sec. Uh, in Deuteronomy 27, 22, it says, Cursed be anyone who lies with his sister, whether the daughter, whether the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Amen.
Um, and it gets a little bit more severe in, Le in uh, Leviticus 20. Which verse is that? But it's not really saying what we're talking about. Yeah, it doesn't specifically say. It just says, you shall be cursed. But does, yeah, like, what does that mean? So uh, Leviticus 20, 12 gets a little bit more serious. It says, if a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood is upon them. No. Yeah. She's like, she's like, she's a really nice little girl. There's only two. Um, there are two sins in the Bible that actually specify burning as the specific mode of execution, uh, and one of them is if a man marries a woman and her mother. It literally says that you shall, they shall be burned. So it gets it gets pretty serious because you can start getting into some some really horrible things yeah, that start to like happen. I said, my, my, you know, she, she's a nice girl, but her, her daughter gets like, you know, hey, 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 yeah. 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 well, let's do that. It's bad. Don't do it. Well, yeah, yeah. Doesn't matter how you do it. I'll give the same thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, right. It, it doesn't. Yeah, it definitely says that drunkenness is a sin. Mm -hmm. It definitely being drunk is definitely a sin, but it also it doesn't list a specific penalty for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's right. Spiritual death, anybody that sins the soul, that sin shall die. In terms of justice, where there's a specific penalty that's supposed to be meted out to somebody by like a judge in a court and all that stuff, it doesn't list anything. So in terms of like uh, restitutionary stuff, theft is something that would obviously punish things like murder. Um, so for theft, there's actually a provision in the law where depending on the attitude of the thief, uh, he would actually be penalized more or less. So if you steal something, or let's say you borrow somebody, you borrow something from a friend of yours and then you say, ah, oh, I lost it, but you actually kept it. Um, let's say at some point you realize that, oh, you know, I feel really guilty about that. I'm gonna go give it back. You can't just go give it back and it'll be good. You have to add 20% on top of whatever it was, the value of what you took. So there was an encouragement there for you to actually turn yourself in and there would be a reduced penalty. Now, if you were caught, then you would pay double. And if you had destroyed the property, then you pay five times. Mm -hmm. The Pentateuch lays out a lot of laws. Um, Numbers has some as well. So yeah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy starts to lay out a lot of those laws. Numbers continues, a, 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 well, the first part of Exodus continues with a lot more of the history and then goes into the laws and then sort of continues the story. Leviticus is like almost entirely laws. Number, numbers is kind of half and half. And Deuteronomy is a repeating of the law that was from Exodus. Yes. Chapter 3, verse 21. Is that where God clothed them with animal skins? I think that's definitely possible. I wonder if it was a lamb that he clothed them with. We're not told. I think that would be, that's, uh, that's a really good observation. Yeah, he clothed them with skins. That's the, if you, if you think of clothing, it's something that covers your shame. It's a, it's a covering in terms of um, Christ's sacrifice. Now we're clothed, we're, we're told in the New Testament, we're clothed with his righteousness. So he uses that same picture. We're not told. Um, we're told that Adam and Eve, they tried to sow fig leaves. Well, what happens to leaves? They, leaves, they just fall off and, and die. Animal skins are a little bit longer lasting. <laughs> So with the, uh, with the different penalties for theft, so if you steal something and you turn yourself in, then you pay, it would be a 120% penalty. If you're, let's say somebody catches you with some stolen property, but you still have it, well, so you have to give back what you stole plus an additional to base, so that now, because you intended to steal from somebody else, now you feel it. So you're taught exactly what you did to the other person, because now you're out a sheep or a shirt or a car or, or whatever it would be. These, these, all these laws are like, they were being misused. That's why Jesus came. Mm -hmm. Because we were misusing all these laws. The, the Jews, the Pharisees, they were, they were taking too much power. They, were, they, weren't, they weren't following the laws, right? Right. They weren't like they were supposed to, like God So all these laws are done with that we're talking about right now. The, the new laws are not. They were preaching man made. I don't know if it's Jesus or the he didn't come to abolish it, he came to make it full, make it complete. Um, we're told that the law didn't die, we did. We did, yeah. We died. So it's like the, with the law of marriage. If, if uh, they're bound to be together as long as they both live, if one dies, if the one that still survives remarries, that person's not committing adultery because they died to that law of marriage because one of the, one of the spouses died. So it's not that the law's gone, it's that I died to the curse of the law. But also, we're told in Romans that we establish the law through our faith. So how are we supposed to establish something that we are also dead to? Yeah, it's kind of weird. Just got to take it by faith. So listen, uh, there's a verse that what you mentioned with the Pharisees, they were condemning all the people with all the law. They were misusing it for sure. Jesus had the strictest words for the ones that were purporting to be teachers of the law. 
where they said, um, Jesus told them, he said, you tithe your mint leaves and your dill leaves. Like that's how fastidious they were. But then like they would devour widows' houses yeah. and oppress the poor and, and the, the foreigners in the land. Yeah. Um, so in Mark, uh, in Mark 7, verse 5, the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? There was a tradition that said, you must wash your hands before you eat. That's not in the law. That's something the Pharisees added. And then Jesus says to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites that as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles his parents must surely be put to death. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained for me is korban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. Thus, you void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things that you do. So if you'll notice here, Jesus actually condemns the Pharisees. Not only do you not execute children who dishonor their parents, you actually encourage them to do it. Yeah, that was his rebuke to the Pharisees. Yeah, the Pharisees were mm-hmm. so, but, but right, in terms, of, in terms of the law, it's an interesting dynamic there. Um, are you familiar with... Um, like when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. You remember he did it two times? Yes, why? Mm-hmm. Because God, Moses goes up the mountain to get the law from God. He comes down and he breaks the tablets because the Israel has committed idolatry. They've built the golden calf and they're worshiping it. Mm-hmm. He was up there for over a month. And the people got bored and they're like, Moses is never going to come back. We're, well, let's build a golden calf. So, so yeah, the first time that Moses goes up to get the law, God writes it down, and then Moses comes down, and he, and he, Moses breaks the law when he sees the people's sins. Mm, that's later. That's rebellion of Korah. So um, you have, then Moses goes back up to get the law the second time. But the second time, God says, Moses, I'm going to speak the law to you, and you're going to write it down. And then Moses brings that down. And then where do those, do you know where those two tablets end up? What happens to them? They go in the Ark of the Covenant. Where does the Ark of the Covenant go? In the temple. Yeah, you got it. So you've got the two pictures. You've got the old law and you've got the new law. The old law was broken because of sin, Israel's sin. The new law is taken, put into the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant goes into the heart of the temple. What is the temple? What does the temple represent? Uh, Tabernacle was an early form of the temple. The temple represents God united with man. And it goes into the heart of the temple, the Holy of Holies. So you have the old law, which was broken because the people disobeyed it. It wasn't... mm -hmm. And then the new law was taken and put into the heart of the temple which is the temple is God, but God, the temple is also God dwelling within my heart. So now Christ lives in my heart. Christ obeyed the law perfectly. He fulfilled it. And so now that's in my heart. So did it say what happened in the heart? Probably there's a story in the Holy War. Really? Something like that. I don't think anybody knows for sure. Not I'm, I'm kind of glad that it's nobody knows exactly what happened to it because people would probably be worshiping it <laughs> if we still had it. Right, right. There were some nations that stole it from Israel. I was actually just, just reading about that. The, the Philistines stole it, and they tried to put it in all of their temples, and wherever whatever city they would bring the ark to, they would like break out in boils and tumors, and they'd be like, get it out of here, throw it away in a different city. They basically curse anybody that tried to steal it. So now, so yeah, the old covenant we have—it's the law that we couldn't keep, right? Yeah. And the new, the new covenant is somebody else kept it for us. So the first, the first commandments came down, but they weren't the same. They were the same. Okay. 
They were the same commandments both times. And so, yeah, Christ kept them on our behalf. And so we know that I'm made right not because of what I did, but somebody else kept the law for me, which what Jesus, Jesus did. He obeyed everything. He never sinned. He kept it on every single point. And so now I believe that he did that on my behalf. And I now get his life. His life is accredited to me. The same laws. I don't know specifically. Did he just, yeah, he broke them and immediately was like, oh, dang, I forgot what those were. I got to go get them again. I forgot all, what all of them were. I don't know if it was necessarily just the tablets. There could have been more than just those commandments, those Ten Commandments that were written on it. But it was, I think God used, God uses all of these stories as symbology for what we have now. So we know that the law was given two times. We know that the law, the letter of the law kills, but the spirit gives life. And so you read these laws and yeah, these are all letters of the law. Um, but when you understand the motivation behind them, then you can start to see the depth of it and different ways to apply that principle in a lot of different ways ways that the law doesn't specifically spell out. Otherwise, it would be ginormous and you'd never be able to read them all. That was a complaint that the, that, uh, the Israelites said. They said, we had leeks and onions to eat when, it was, when we were in Egypt. The slavery wasn't that bad. Why don't we just go back? And God said, because I promised that you would never go back. Yeah, the manna, yeah. manna from heaven. They would have to go out and gather it every day. Yeah, yeah they were complaining. And God, one, God said, okay, fine. How about quail? I'll give you quail every day. And they got tired of that. And they said, let's just go back to Egypt. <laughs> There's, they wandered around and God said, your sandals didn't wear out. You were literally walking around in the same pair of shoes for 40 years. Your feet didn't swell. You never got, like, you walked around for 40 years and you did fine. What, what was that last part? Because he was too lazy to ride him back out himself. He just wanted God to do it for him again. I don't know what the reasons are. <laughs> We're just told what happened. You know, maybe it was the fact that God had the commandments on the first half of the form, you know, that he was in, you know, that same symbolism. Well, I also think there's a, you learn things a lot better when, when you have to then re recite them and tell them to other people. So now it's not just... Because when it's, somebody hands me a copy of something, it's like, oh, yeah, I'll remember this. I'll, I'll do what it says. But if somebody actually has to, if you take dictation, you tend to retain it a lot more. Yeah, we're not told exactly why, but it's a, it's a really fascinating picture of the two covenants. I just have one question. One more. Uh, what texts do we have, ancient texts, do we actually have in the Bible? Because I know a lot of these, I've heard that some of them are missing. We got There's a wide variety of copies, and there are a lot of uh, textual variants that disagree, like there will be a word missing, or the word order will be different, like, spelling will be off, or it'll say there's a, there's a Hebrew word it's three letters long, and they weren't sure if one of those letters was added, and it's the difference in Hebrew between the word he and the word God. It doesn't really change the meaning. But there are some, there are some variants, and then there's also uh, the Apocrypha, 
which are like the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas and uh, First and Second Maccabees. Uh, yeah, supposedly Judas wrote his own version of the Gospel as well. Yeah, there are. Uh, there's a. That's a whole. That's a whole um, area of study called textual criticism. If you want to look into that, there's some really fascinating things. There, um, in terms of all of the works of antiquity, because you're right, we don't have the originals of any of these books. We don't have the original copies of any of any text of the Bible. We have um, what the Bible has going for it is a plethora of copies, orders of magnitude. No, usually same translation. There is a so the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and there are a few passages in Aramaic. And then there was a translation of that called the Septuagint, which was a translation from that into Greek, which is then what most people were familiar with in Jesus's day, because a lot of the Jews spoke Greek because that was the language of the world back then. Um, so you have the Septuagint. Um, and then the New Testament, we, have, we, ha we do have parts of copies within like 20, 30 years of when they were originally written. So we don't have the originals, but we've got stuff that was written possibly while the apostles were still alive that are still intact. So in terms of all of the, all of the works that we have of antiquity, we have closer to the original time-wise, and the amount of texts that we do have is uh, more, I think, more than like 50 to 1. There are other works like, um, what are some other ones, like the Beowulf manuscripts and... Uh, writings from Socrates and Plato and things like that, that we have like two, copy, yeah. two copies of, <laughs> yeah. of all of Plato's works, but you don't have anybody going, did Plato ever really exist? Did he write yeah. this? How can we be sure that any yeah. of this stuff is accurate? Yeah. Yeah. But then the Bible, it's like, you go to the Gospel of Luke and it's like, we have 8,000. The Odyssey is actually mm -hmm. the And the Iliad, yeah. But we only have like one little bitty page and they translate it to this whole big story. But then in terms, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting study. There's a lot of history there. It's called, uh, t this, the field of study is called textual criticism, if you ever yeah. feel like getting into that. But yeah, there are, there are guys that know a lot more about that than I do, that they'll, they'll be involved in the translations of, like, they'll, they will literally go back and have, be granted access to the manuscripts that we have. And it's nice to have a puzzle with a whole bunch of extra pieces because people were too careful. They're like, ah, I'm just going to throw these away. It's like, no. We don't know which ones of these are extras, so they keep all of them. But as you go back and you sort of reverse engineer what the original one said, you can kind of deduce with pretty good accuracy. There are certain copies of the Bible that you can get where the words will be color coded and you can like uh, it's software, Logos software, where you can roll your mouse over and it will tell you all the different variations and actually the names of the manuscripts you can click on and it will give you pictures of the manuscript copies that we have. So there's all kinds of tools and resources for that. Cool. If you ever want to get into it, people use that for actually translating into like the e English Standard Version or the NASB. We use, we use those texts to, to, to translate. Mm -hmm. direct, yeah, direct from the original oh. languages, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a little after eight o'clock. If anybody wants to stay, we can keep talking. I know it's not a hard, you have to be done at eight. And I know this is boring for some of you guys, so I apologize that you're forced to be here. <laughs> I was, uh, they asked me this two weeks ago and you weren't here. So um, my, I was just raised, my dad, we, we read and talked about the Bible for one to two hours every morning, five days a week. And that was outside of like Wednesday night Bible studies in church and stuff like that. So we went all into like uh, uh, the creationism versus evolution, got real deep into that, a little bit into textual criticism. So it's like, I have a smattering of a whole bunch of different topics. I'm not a world expert in any particular one. But I have a I have a respectable overview, <laughs> so I hope it's I hope it's interesting. Thanks for playing. Moses got just didn't let Moses understand what was wrote on the tablets before he got there. Maybe he was just trying to pull laws and illuminate it so it's safe enough. Mm -hmm. And whenever he broke them, he didn't know, like he knew it was a law, but he didn't know what. The so there's a really interesting passage where the people would break the laws over and over and over again. And they would come to Moses be like, hey, we have this problem. We have this conflict between the two of us. Like this guy stole my sheep. And he says, I, I say, I didn't do it, but he says I did, he's accusing me. So Moses would sit and just tell them stuff over and over. 
and we're told that um, God would speak to Moses plainly and he would speak to the rest of the people in riddles so that they wouldn't understand. And it was God basically had a special place for Moses to where he would make everything clear because it was up to Moses to then teach the people. Mm -hmm. Jesus would speak in parables and it, would, it was specifically for, he told his disciples, he says, I speak so that they won't understand what I'm saying, but I'm giving you special knowledge. And he would lay out, he said, uh, like the parable of the, uh, the parable of the sower in the fields and all that stuff. And people would be like, what does this story mean? And he would take his disciples away privately and they would discuss it and Jesus would spell it out for them. So it's, uh, I think it really coincides with Jesus saying, don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't just give people the answers and expect them to retain it. If they're, you let them wonder about it. It's like if somebody, if you uh, tell somebody the secret to a magic trick, I know that's a bad example. It's over. No, but it, there's, there's a fascination with it if people don't know how it works. And then they actually care about the solution rather than it's like, hey, you don't start a magic trick with, hey, here's the answer. Here you go. There's no, yeah, if you know what it is, there's no fascination with, with the magnitude of, oh, wow, that's actually really brilliant because you fooled me. I, I'm interested. It's like on 21 where they do their magic trick with their cards and tells a tree for 31 years. Like, he puts that card in a tree for 31, like, when he's a kid, he puts a card in there. And 31 years later, he comes back to the same tree and does a magic trick. So he gets a tree in half and, you know, writes down what the card's going to be. And, of course, it's there. And it's just like, man, that's really cool how to get that card in the tree, Well, Right. Pre-planning. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah. Look forward to seeing you here next week. Yeah. Two weeks, yeah. Whatever the next time, I'll be here. Okay, sounds good. Thanks for coming. Yes, sir. Brian, right? Yes, sir. And I've been praying and praying for the knowledge. I want to get in the Bible. Like you said, your dad was had. Two hours? One to two hours every day. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel like anything special. But now that I'm almost I'm 29 years old now, it adds up. It's like 10, 12, 14,000 hours worth of Bible study that didn't really feel that, didn't feel like work. I mean, we just do what I did here. You read the Bible and you talk about it. You read it and you talk about it. You do that every day for your whole life. And you become an expert without really realizing that you, you've done that. Well, I'm learning how to read right now. I'm going to GD classes. So I've got to learn. If I can read. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I can read it. I don't understand. I don't know if they will let you do this here. Um, well, I see that y'all got DVDs and stuff. You might put in a request if they can get, like, a, an audio Bible. I've got a dramatized version here to where... Like, I pick a book of the Bible I want to listen to and hit play, and it'll just read it to me. And it's dramatized. They have voice actors and sound effects and music. So it's like listening to a movie. Yeah. So I'm in First Samuel right now. I'll say it will never happen. As soon as you come to the city, you will meet a prophet's coming down from the high place with heart and Wow. So you can listen to the entire Bible. I mean, I downloaded this for free. So I don't know if they can order a set of CDs for you guys. You might, you might request that. And you can start doing that now. You can just listen to it. You don't have to read anything. It'd be nice. So it's hard to read it. And me going back and trying to understand it. Mm -hmm. Well, and especially like when you get out, you can. I listen while I'm driving in the car or just on an airplane ride or, or whatever. You just. I, I just hit play and I go to sleep listening to it. It's really nice to uh, talk to somebody. Yeah, get to know more about mm -hmm. the Bible. There's a lot to learn. And then. And uh, I'm excited that you've that you've come to the faith, and there's a reason that it's called spiritual birth because it's just the beginning. There's a lot to learn that your life, as a new believer, you grow into it, and eventually, in the life that we continue to live on this earth before God does finally take us home, what can we do now to show people the evidence of what has really happened in our lives? How can I give forgiveness? Now I go out and I want to forgive other people because of the things that I've done. That I, there are things that I've done I should be dead for. And God has shown me grace and he's given me a little bit of time left on this earth to where I can go and show people that I know how to handle it when people do wrong things to me. 
And I don't hold, I don't harbor that anger. I know how to forgive. Because God showed me how, he showed me that first. Good to see you. Hey, thanks, man. Appreciate you. Thanks, appreciate you. I never got a record. I'm already off for like three, three and a half months. I'm sober since. That's good. Since I what were you on? Methamphetamines. Okay. Hard up substances, chemicals. Yeah. But, you know, some people say, well, you don't look like it. But I've been on it for 12 years. I stopped, tried to stop one year, but, you know, my friend's coming over. And how did you get on it in the first place? How much? How, how did you get on methamphetamines? Oh, me selling it. Yeah. And then you just decided to try it? Yeah, it was better than cocaine. It burns. I like the burn sensation. What uh, what got you interested to sell it in the first place? Oh, poor family. You know, I was young. I didn't see the money. I just party and party. You know, so I can't really. Since I was 20, I didn't want to party. I just got out of school work. Mm -hmm. I like, there's money to be made. I never, never, you know, all the money I made, I spent it. Mm -hmm. Well, I learned I had, uh, I didn't go to drugs, but I learned that I had a pretty, a big problem with managing money as well. I used to like the ping in rooms. The what? Ping in rooms where you play the money. Oh yeah. And you play money. Mm -hmm. yeah. Casinos, yeah. I thank them every day for opening my eyes and making me realize. So it, it slowed me down a lot. And when I go outside, I see the the different colors, you know, the wind blowing. Mm -hmm. I'm enjoying all that. Yeah, it's a fallen world, but it's still very beautiful. It's yeah. a it's a shadow of what it used to be, and it's a shadow of what it will be someday. But yeah, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. They definitely do. Nobody can look at this world and say, oh, I'm not really sure if there is a God or not. No, everybody knows. Yeah. Everybody knows. It's too, it's too amazing. This, yeah. Did you check yourself in here, or how did you get here? Uh, I'm a volunteer checking. Okay. I came on my own. Uh, I need a change. But to be the father and the husband for my wife. Yes. It's good to see you, Brian. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Yes, I will. Be praying for you.